But we've got lots of room for technical CO2 questions later in the morning. The ones, um, the ones that had them died. Today is a very cold day. A lot of us are going to be experiencing in the afternoon. And there is an evening lecture. And there's an evening lecture. Pace yourself. Keep your eye on the clock. Pace yourself. Keep the clock in. It's on the bus. Keep yourself going. I know that we were having some technical issues with one of the In a university like ours, we call that a teaching moment because technical issues with these instruments are indeed part and parcel. <laughs> no, I think we're fine. Ask the, go up, walk, up, walk up to the back and look at the screen and see if you really think you need to. You can do this. So thus far, I've covered talking about the CO2 system, a little bit about what I consider the more ostentatiously obscure measurements, pH and alkalinity. And now really gets into what I think is important, which is after taking all this trouble to buy equipment, collect samples, make measurement, Why did I do that? And partly what I'm going to talk about here is just the measurement piece and the sampling. It's related to both. And in essence, this is the sort of sensible definition of quality assurance. That somewhere, if you're going to make these measurements, you have to have a system in your laboratory that you feel is adequate to assure outside users the analytical now this comes from obviously a textbook on analytical chemistry and it's referred mostly at laboratories that sell their skills for hire. And you say, well heck, the measurements are for me. Well that's not quite true because if you never write that paper based on them and that indeed is part of the thing, is persuading the users, in that case the people that read your paper and the, yourselves, in fact, are the main users, that the analytical results you pr are of proven and known quality. It doesn't say in this phrase, and, and I never will say in this discussion, of tiny uh, uncertainty or highly accurate. These are somewhat irrelevant terms without a context to discuss them in. So, known quality. So, oh my God, you said philosophy 101. You know, you can, in my youth, you could buy a book <laughs> discussing this at great length. <laughs> but we're going to cut a number of corners there and really define quality in a very simple phrase. This is one of the ways that people talk about it, fitness for purpose. So that's why you made the measurement, so you could make some decision based upon it. The measurement has to be good enough to allow you to do that. So good enough is in some way related to the uncertainty of the measurement. That is, that it's the uncertainty relative to the need. You can say, well, oh, I can make this measurement to plus or minus 1%. Uh, and I can explain to you that a 1% error will not allow you to see what you thought you could reliably. So you have to do better than that. 
Or I could say to you, well, hey, if you would just come to my lab and study at the knees of the master for two years, we could get you to do alkalinities to, you know, one twentieth of a percent. And you say, well, I, but I, I've, I've checked. I really only need them to three tenths. How much time can I save? <laughs> How much money can I save? So ultimately, this has implications for the level of resources that you need. That you have to understand how good your measurements are. You have to have a system that allows you not only to know how good they are, but to be persuasive when you explain to others how good they are. Oh, they're wonderful, is not sufficient. And you've got to put an appropriate amount of resources into doing this that is sufficient to achieve your objectives. But in some ways, the people that have to have a Rolls Royce to go out to Safeway are overdoing it a bit. They've spent more than they needed to. Now, most of the people I've ever met that had Rolls Royces, that was not a problem to them. Some, it was a personal luxury. And they had nothing else. You have to decide what you need, what you have available for this, but you have to spend enough to achieve your objectives. And therefore you have to realize, how do I know I'm, what are those objectives? And how do I know that I'm achieving them? And so there's a whole link of stuff, and mostly what we're talking about here, this, I think in this picture, they weren't very descriptive about what their picture meant, is that the quality control is kind of in both pieces. This whole section, which is coming under this heading quality assurance, but ultimately you're starting out and saying, what do I need? What uncertainty is that? How can I show I have it? Feeds back because, you know, that there is some feedback. It's not straightforward. You say, oh yeah, I'll do this to, to two tenths of a percent. And then you find out that you can only do it to three tenths of a percent. There's a little bit of feedback here. You go, well, did I really need it that good? It would have been nice, but I'm not gonna, you know, there's a limited market on eBay for used titrators while I buy the bigger and better and newer model. So there's a sort of trade-off here, and, and what this idea is to try and get you, as you go into this, to plan from the beginning, rather than just go to somebody and say, what should I get? Because 90% of the time, and I'd like to think if you came to me, it'd be only be 75% of the time, they'll say, have one of the ones I've got and love. And that's because they've owned it, they've invested a lot of time in making it work, it's rare that you will find a laboratory that has tried every available method equally much. And so think about it yourself and try and get those informations. Personal recommendations really help, but remember those do come with bias. And you can buy an apparatus and get lousy results with it, no trouble. The whole aspect, aspect, aspects of quality assurance is how do you sort of go beyond that? And so quality control is really the aim. The aim of the whole thing, quality control, and it's a, become a jargon, and in oceanography it's become a, a, a different usage I'll mention momentarily. The aim is to ensure that the data generated are of known accuracy to some stated quantitative degree of probability, and thus provide quality, i.e. fitness for purpose, that is satisfactory, dependable, and economic. Those are the key features you've got. For many people, when they say, oh, we QC'd the data, what they mean is they looked at it carefully and threw away the points they thought didn't look good. Here, what you're saying, ultimately, is you're designing the measurement process in the laboratory so that you don't get data that don't look good to the best of your ability. Of course, you've also got to have enough that you could reassure others that you did actually achieve that because that's an important part as well. So effective quality control, what would you guess was the most important piece to having reliable, 
dependable measurements of a known uncertainty. Hmm? Standard? Hmm? Reputation? Replication. Replication. Okay, sorry. Record keeping? Protocols? All good things. My first guess would be this. <laughs> Ultimately, the quality of your measurements depends upon the people making them. And mostly, this is why university laboratories particularly have never really gone formally for quality control as a part of their laboratory work because so much depends upon the skills of the people and that's often one of the things they do achieve as skilled people. They can get data that people think is good, dependable, etc., etc., based largely on that alone. Whether it really is dependent the other things you don't know because they've got no system for showing you that. They've just kind of convinced you. This is why reputation was my mishearing of replication. <laughs> You've got to have equipment that works. That means you've got to buy it. You've got to maintain it. And probably you have to use it in as ideal conditions as you can. If it has to be made on a small boat, then the equipment had better be as well designed for that. But you know, most of these things, you get much better data with a lot of the measurement techniques if you do it in a laboratory whose temperature doesn't change very much, as opposed to if you were to just to plug it in and do it in a garden shed. Then we come on, in my opinion, to the need for actually doing the same thing every time that is what you expected to do, that is what anybody else using this method would probably do. Finally, the requirement for reference materials, and I'm going to come back and discuss about this, because you have to have some way of checking the performance of your measurements. And the easiest way to do that is to run, as though it were a sample, a substance that actually you know the answer to. And to do this frequently, and to keep track of the results that you get. Because in that case, you do get a sensible information about how well your system is working. There's a temptation, not always resistible, to use such a material to calibrate your system. OK, that's fine. But then you have to do something else to allow you to convince to evaluate the measurement performance. Because if the measurement performance is always perfect, that is, it always reads 2200 when I put this stuff in, because I adjust it to do that, that does not mean you have a perfectly operating instrument. Finally, the documentation that was mentioned, that you've got to keep track of this, and you've got to keep track of all that so that you can say, yes, this is what's happening. This is what happened last week. This is what's happening now. Is it the same? This is what happened last year. This is what's happening now. Is it within the limits of uncertainty that my needs expressed? <laughs> so one of the two ones that I'm going to emphasize more is this requirement for documented, validated measurement procedures. Documented means that they've been carefully described and written down. Validated is a little harder. It means that they've been used carefully to show that they actually do do what you thought they might. We have in this many procedures, one for total carbon using coulometry, a couple for alkalinity, one with a closed cell, one with an open cell, a couple for pH, spectrophotometry, buffers, 
These are all, in my opinion, well-documented procedures. They are probably, to a lesser extent, well-validated procedures. Most of them are, but some of them have hardly been used. So it would be fair to say that the validation is weaker. But what do you care about for validation? You don't care, at least you should not care, that when I run an open cell alkalinity in my lab, I have every reason to believe the answers are very good. What you care about is when you run an open cell alkalinity in your lab. And so the validation is not something inherent to the procedure as an abstract concept, though that's part of it. The validation is relative to your implementation of that procedure in your own laboratory. So that if you have something you set up in your lab, you then have to show to your satisfaction that it works. And uh, probably it would be fair to say that you probably should be more scrupulous about this than you're tempted to be. Because if it seems to work, you want to get on and analyze some samples, right? But you probably should spend a little more care thinking, how, how sure am I this way? How have I tested this? You know, is this just because my top lab person set it up and seems to get good data? Or what would happen if the uh, undergraduate student who's really going to run these samples runs this equipment? So the validation is really for your implementation of a method. Reference materials. <coughs> A substance that's stable, that you know properties well enough to calibrate a chemical analyzer or validate a measurement process. In part, this is one of the key uses for references, is validating those processes. You know what the answer should be. You actually got it independent of knowing that answer. This is reassuring. How closely you get it varies from somewhat reassuring to very reassuring. How often that happens the same thing. Ideally, they should be as close to the sample of interest in the, their matrix as possible. Because then you're treating them in a perfect process as though they were a sample. It should not be that they do something different for the apparatus from your average sample. Because your goal here is to say, how well am I really analyzing samples? So to say, aha. It's a reference to I have to treat this one extra special to be sure to get the right answer. If such you can achieve, surely you should do that for every sample. And ideally, there, there are a variety, there's a whole hierarchy of reference materials available to one, and we'll talk a little about that. Some of these can simply be your container of seawater that you poison with mercuric chloride. What do you know about that? Probably, you should get the same answer repeatedly from analyzing. That alone is a great test. Without knowing whether it's the right answer or the wrong answer, just being able to have the machine give you the same answer over and over again is extremely reassuring that there's a chance that it's going to work well. So reference fields have this. Ideally, you know the properties and you know the uncertainty of the properties assigned to them because Typically, the methods chosen for certifying reference materials are focused on an understanding of their accuracy and overall uncertainty. Ideally, those methods will have been run by more than one person, so there isn't any obvious personal. The method has been shown not to be susceptible to which operator was running it as to the results you get. Few such materials exist. If you buy uh, the ones from your national Institute for Standards and Technology. Everybody I know that's bought a reference film goes, $300 for 20 grams? And those are the cheaper ones. <laughs> so th there's a trade-off here, because if you have only the most expensive reference materials, so be it. But the key, remember, is this validation of your process. I'll tell you what's available for seawater. One is one that we distribute. The only photograph I have is as old actually much older, this is batch 24, as the uh, bottle you saw in the coulometry film yesterday, the paper label rather than the uh, plastic label on it and the latex rubber band rather than the 
black rubber bands that we now use. So this is seawater, so it has that benefit. It is like your samples, except this is seawater that I acquired off the coast of California, so its salinity is usually in 33 and a bit. If you look at yours and it's 35 and a bit, if it was batch 24, it would, I think, really have been 35 because that water came from the mid-Atlantic. But mostly we actually just evaporate some seawater by leaving it in a laminar flow hood for a long time and then pollute the seawater we get with this to bring the salinity up a little bit. And we do that occasionally on batches to give a little bit of variety to them. So if the salinity really matters, like you're running a estuarine sample at 15, salinity 15, and this is 35, will that matter? For many methods, not too much for some more. You should be aware of how the matrix affects it. This is certified. Uh, it's perhaps a slight overstatement, but it's, it's close. For salinity, total dissolved inorganic carbon, and total alkalinity. And the, the terms in parentheses are what I believe the uncertainty that is expressed as one standard deviation of the the, the number is for, for these. So this is a combination of the precision and estimates we've made of the likely accuracy of doing this. Salinity is so large, not because we're particularly lousy at measuring salinity, but in actual fact, the salinity changes from bottle number one of a batch to bottle number 1,010 of a batch because the, there's some small evaporation in the day and uh, you can tell this with a decent salinometer. Also, we put mercuric chloride in that batch, so bets are off a little bit as to how much that changes the salinity to conductivity parameters a little bit. So that, that's why this is a, a larger number. These ones are probably about right. Some days they might be a little worse, some days a little better. And we provide information values for nutrients. That is, we collect samples, we analyze them for nutrients, but the chance that what's in your bottle exactly has those nutrients two years later, no, no, I'm not making any comment about that. We're not looking at it for the stability of the nutrients. The nutrients typically are low because it comes from surface seawater, and uh, largely they can be ignored. The chance that you're making measurements sufficiently careful that those values matter to you is, is slim. And the stability, I think, is three years is what I would say. I think it might be more than that. Now, other certified materials are available from my laboratory in small quantities. One, we've talked about, yes? Oh, yeah, I mean, what Chris is pointing out is an inverse of what we emphasized the other day, that if you've got a sample of seawater and the constants are constant, not changing with time, then in principle, if two of the parameters are known to stay constant with time, other parameters will stay constant with time. That is, the bicarbonate ion concentration at 25 degrees would stay constant with time. The pH at 20 degrees would stay constant with time. The PCO2 at 5 degrees would stay constant with time. So in principle, you can use these as stable seawater samples for pH. It has advantages. If you use a tris buffer for pH, it's a buffer. It's well buffered. You can breathe on it. Hardly change it, really won't. Do that with a seawater sample, and it's going to wander around. So you're now starting to get, when you get an uncertainty, what you really want, which is part of it's your sample handling contributes to the uncertainty. Part of it is your analytical measurement contributes to the uncertainty. And so I would recommend, you know, if you are interested to 
keep an eye on your pH measurement, occasionally run this kind of reference tool. If you're also doing, let's say, alkalinities in the lab, it's ideal because, you know, a bottle that you've taken some out the top and put the stopper carefully back in is going to be good for an alkalinity measurement for another week or so before bugs that got in there went, oh, we can just to say make it in this mercuric chloride solution, and it starts to change. We find if you open the bottle, the three years that I mentioned here is if you don't open the bottle. That is, within one hour of having opened the bottle, it's not quite so bad that you can only rely on this reference material if you don't use it. <laughs> but if you put the top back in again and leave it one day and measure alkalines, they'll be perfect. Three days, we can't see the difference in my lab. One week, we're starting to see changes. One month, oh yeah. And the mercury hasn't come out of that solution. What's actually happened is bugs have got in that can tolerate mercury. And so we kind of take this thing, we, the bottles are clean so there's nothing much there that have been close to mercury. We make sure to minimize that. But any lab that you're handling seawater with mercury in, you will have bugs that can tolerate mercury growing around there unless you're very scrupulous at cleaning that seawater up all the time. For alkalinity, for total carbon, it de the quality of it decays as the headspace grows relative to the uh, water because you can get exchange of CO2 between them. But for alkalinity, exchange of CO2 makes no difference. For total carbon, pH, and PCO2, it will. The Tris buffer, which again, we're going to start putting in the smaller bottles. The ones you've got here are 250 mil bottles. It's certified to about 003. Stability is about one year. Is the pH always uh, one value? Or? The pH of these buffers is dependent on three things. The temperature you measure it at. That's the most important. It's a function of temperature, strong function of temperature. Second, when you make it up, did you make it up perfectly? And so it's close. We're usually within about 0 0.002 of what we think it should be when we made it up really carefully over and over. But what we actually do is make up a large batch and then analyze some of that batch. So what I pr suggest as a number for these is that you take the literature value of what the pH should be and adjust it at all temperatures by a small offset because probably the most common thing we would have got wrong is it's not a 50-50 buffer ratio, but a 49-51 buffer ratio. Actually, it wouldn't be that one. 49.5, 50.5. So that slight difference in buffer ratio means it's a slightly different pH. But having done that, that difference actually applies over the whole temperature range uh, with hardly any adjustment, not an adjustment worth making. So it will come with a number. That number will be close to 8.1, but it won't be exactly the same every time. It'll waffle around by about 0.003. Stability, as I said, is about a year, and I showed you a picture of that yesterday. Hydrochloric acid, we've, there's a, a bottle here at, upstairs in uh, room 423. It's a one liter uh, Pyrex bottle. It's, we certify these, we certify these. This, this, this analysis we can do. We think they're good to about 0.02%. And that's everything, precision, accuracy, the whole lot. And stability, I don't really know. For sure it's more than five years. <laughs> so the benefit of this to me is that if you calibrate if you use one of our reference materials to calibrate your system, you typically adjust the acid because you say, I couldn't make the acid up accurately. But what you actually have is every error in your system is now built into that acid number. That is, if your volume dispensing was wrong, either in your burette or in measuring out the sample, if your electrode wasn't behaving perfectly, if you weren't allowing for the fact that the acid density changes with temperature and the number you got, you, 
was made one day at one temperature, but not, you know, they're kind of all built in there. If you put a known acid in, the bad news is suddenly you realize what all those other errors are. The good news is you have a chance of finding them and fixing them. It's a sort of trade-off. So let's just talk about the whole variety of quality problems. I mean, there's a lot of things you can do. And a lot of these you should be doing all the time in your lab to make sure that things are working sensibly. Repetitive measurements. This is replicates, somebody said. You measure the same sample more than once. Do you get the same result within an understandable difference? If not, your apparatus is not working properly. Internal test samples. This is where you make, you know, this is what I'm saying. You have a large container. Maybe you fill yourself a set of 20 or 30 bottles from it, and you use those. You don't know accurately what the answer is, but you do know that it should be the same for all these. It's like deliberately making yourself a lot of replicates that you can use, not just today when you did a repeat. Typically, this is one of the problems. People say, aha, look, this instrument's working well. Here's the standard deviation on the six measurements I made today. And it's one. Well, I'd say to you first that if you made a standard deviation from six measurements, that's one plus one minus a half. It's somewhere in that range. And second, if you made the same measurements in two months' time on the same material, those two should be part of this standard deviation. And it'll always grow. It's always bigger. So what you really want is, the answer is, how good is it for a sample I put through my system? And any time you do this, the goal is not to say, look, this is the best my equipment can do. That's nice to know. But it's nicest to know if you know for sure it's behaving like that always. <coughs> Control charts. We'll just talk a little bit about this momentarily. But essentially, this is just trying to encourage you to recognize that your mind is good at pattern recognition and not so good at memory, and to take advantage of this. Interchange of operators. If two different people don't get the same result on the same sample, on the same equipment. You've got a procedural problem there. Something is happening that you don't know it's contributing to it. So that's a very good check on that. Because it can be simply as simple that you didn't have the procedure well enough documented. It can be equally simply that people you thought were trained weren't. Or it can be a problem with the equipment that you just hadn't, this is a way to find it. So that's that interchange of equipment. If you have access to more than one, two sets of two titrators that look like they are the same, or to give the same results on the same sample. If they don't, it's probably not something you want to live with if that deviation is too big. You probably want to find out why that is, because it's probably an indication that they aren't identical systems. And just saying, oh, I can calibrate that out, only makes sense if you understand what bit you calibrated and why that was appropriate. <coughs> Independent measurements. Here, th the aim is that you have a different method. And you can compare. And if I did it this way and that way, do I get the same results? That's not so typical for CO2 measurements where you're buying an equipment at 50,000, you don't say, oh yeah, and I'll buy another one of the other type and try it. You typically have had you but world enough in time, right? You know, you're wanting to get the samples. So that is a good idea. Measurements using a definitive method. Most labs don't have access to really high quality measurements. We do in mine. We can compare measurements we do with our coolometry with measurements we do by acidifying seawater and extracting the CO2 and separating the CO2 from the water and putting the CO2 into a contained volume at a controlled temperature and measuring the pressure and saying, therefore, it's this many molecules of CO2. But that was two and a half hours down the drain. So these independent methods are very good. And it's audits. The tiny little word, but basically it means asking somebody in your lab to say, are we really doing the procedures as we think we're doing them? 
have somebody look over shoulder. Are we documenting it, what we said? Are we really doing This is something you can do internally. You, know, you shouldn't need somebody to say, you've got a lousy lab here. That's the last thing you need. But you yourself can, in principle, know that if you're looking for it. External techniques. This is where you're now saying, everything seems to be OK in my lab. I'm prepared to see how this compares to other labs. Because it's a waste of time until you believe you can make the measurement that you would get the same thing over and over. So you can do this by collaborative tests. These are typically samples exchanged around uh, a group. Exchanging samples, this is where, this is typically with a very formal sample, lots of labs. You can do this informally, a couple of labs. Two labs just exchange samples. Do we get the same results on it? Yes, no. External references, that is you buy a reference film and you can run that and check it. A certified reference film, those are always external. Typically. Audits, again, you can ask somebody from outside your lab to check your procedures. That's rarely done. But this is the key you've got to remember. It's important for both the sampling and for the measurement process. So that if you really want to understand this, it's no good having great measurements if you didn't also have great samples. And by taking duplicate samples regularly, you start to get an understanding as to where these two pieces come together to give your final result. So I'm going over here, which means we'll have less discussion, but let me just finish. Control chart. Here's a control chart. The essence of a control chart is we have a, a time history of how the equipment was making measurements. Typically, you have these lines are drawn based on the first few measurements. And here it's about the measurements up to about this point. And you've got a mean, two standard deviations, three standard deviations, up and above. And then you keep plotting. And something probably jumps out at you, which is that it's not a horizontal line. It's not in control. That is, it doesn't get the same answer over and over for the same material. And it jumps out at you because of your ability to recognize patterns. I would swear that most people would not really see that. They just suddenly see that this was a bad measurement. And they'd throw it out. And, ah, see, it's, it's good again. Don't worry about it. It's not until you have that whole picture there that you're using your ability to see patterns relative to your memory of what the answer, you know it's, hey, it's 1978 plus or minus couple. So yeah, I, I ran my thing, yeah, it's within tolerance. By plotting it, you get a good way to have the memory, and it's a thing that builds on your visual patterns. There's a whole literature about how you discuss, you know, when you have one that's right up on a warning limit, is this a hint? that you really need to check, or should you at least try again and see whether it works OK? When you have one outside a control limit, certain labs, their procedures require them essentially to stop measuring samples until they're confident that this is running again. That may not be the way you want to treat it, but I just point out that that's the idea of this, of putting this and getting this. So what this tells you, ultimately, Here's a much more involved control chart from a, a cruise of mine. Here, what you can calculate from this is the mean of the measurements, that black line. I can compare the mean to the certified value, the dotted line. I can compute a standard deviation for this data. It's about one and a half. I can say there's a hint that something sort of changed smoothly, but there's no way I could characterize that really effectively. <laughs> so I, but there's clearly the, the, the equipment's not as stable as I'd hoped. And third, clearly, obviously, I'm rejecting a bunch of data. Those pale gray points. <laughs> the measurement technique has a flaw. This particular technique, we were using a syringe with a mechanical stopping device to measure a certain amount of sample on board ship. And obviously, one or other operator, actually these are both operators, didn't always get the full amount of water. And so when you measured the alkalinity of slightly less water, it was slightly less alkalinity. 
this is a sign. So what you get out of this is a lot of information. You do get a statement of how good your data could be. If you didn't have these data points, how good it was. You get a comment on the precision, the accuracy, but you also start to say, whoa, and this tells me there's something wrong with the technique that needs fixing. And the smart ways to getting high quality measurements are good people and techniques that you fix. You can compare stuff between laboratories. It's done for testing methods, alternate methods, proficiency tests. I'll just show you as a sort of end up one of the first ones we did. This was for coulometry. I call it extraction and coulometry because you acidify, you extract the gas by bubbling through and you measure it in a coulometer. We sent batch two of our reference materials around to labs. And these are the results we got from the labs we sent it to. And the error bar is the 95% confidence limit on their mean. And the result I'd like to believe is the one we did by that vacuum extraction method, which is this one here. And so the, the take home measure, look at this, is things are better than we feared in 1991. But some labs clearly had problems with the method. But I think this actually helped show them they had problems with the method because they hadn't had enough. Here they analyzed, they were given 20 identical samples. They didn't all analyze all of them. <coughs> you can blow this up and now you see the confidence limits for the number we believe and you see that, you know, some of the labs actually were already there. Many weren't. The mean calculated from this, well, on, on the whole, first, people had good standard deviations. Everybody had a standard deviation around one and a half. That was the, the pooled standard deviation of this. But you can see that a good standard deviation alone was not enough. Another piece is that in actual fact, if you average the points that are now on the picture, that is throwing away the two labs that no longer made it when I put the magnifying glass on, the mean was actually about here, right in the gray. So that their systematic er errors were randomly distributed, but randomly distributed between labs. When you never send your sample to 10 different labs and average the numbers. So ultimately, this. What's needed for ocean acidification research? Well, we need robust, reliable analytical techniques that can be used conveniently, ideally on small samples. Do we have this? Probably not. You'll see that with the methods you're learning today. So there's still room for getting better methods for doing this. Each of these methods needs thinking about how you ensure its quality. You know, develop it as a standard method, write the procedures, test it in different labs, figure out what the expected uncertainty of that method is, use reference materials and quality control, one we don't do, but probably should as more of us get involved, actually have formal things where we send around samples you don't know the answer to and then publish the result. Possibly saying you're lab number 27, possibly saying that you're the uh, Dixon Laboratory in La Jolla, California. This is open for discussion. But that would tell us how it goes. So ultimately, as I said, quality assurance is aimed that you know what, how good your results are and that you can reassure users of the results that they really are that good. Our reference material program is progressing through the years. My hair was more and darker earlier on in the process. But this is essentially still how it's done. Big container of water that somebody's filling, two others are putting stoppers on, <laughs> somebody's slapping labels on. <laughs> and just 
1,100 times one day, and we have a batch. So the essence here was that we were going to move into discussion periods. And I think unless there's really specific questions as to what I've said now, most of the questions logically come up in among the discussions we're having and uh, could be done then too. And Alec was going to lead our first discussion.